sound is on. And we should be visible to everybody now. So, hello everyone to the fourth in session. Um, July. Except, 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 except the stream is still showing the. Uh, we're, we're not. We're not. Uh, we're not visible yet. Oh, here we I are. Think it, yeah, it always takes a bit. Like <laughs> there's a slight delay on the YouTube channel, so you're gonna see that a little bit delayed. We are basically coming to you from the future. Uh, Indeed, which is 10 hot. Seconds future. Yeah, it's really <laughs> warm. Exactly. Yeah, it's really warm. Um, I had to shut up the AC in here because it's making too much noise, so I might be dripping in a moment, but that's okay. Uh, what we do for what we do uh, for for touch designer. <laughs> so let's get started, maybe. And as usual, should we should we just introduce each other? Sure. Um, who's going to start? Should I start? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I am going to introduce. Wow, Eric, Eric, yes. who um, Eric is a developer, an amazing developer who's been with us for about three years, I believe, and in that short time by derivative standards is uh, impressively responsible for some very important development. For example, uh, Eric, you've integrated Bullet, Flex, Substance Designer, and Notch, which is, uh, as I said, important and very relevant to uh, the tools that people are using. Thank you, Isabel. Um, so also with us today is uh, Marcus Heckman, and he is, of course, the person behind a lot of the components we have in the palette, including Camp Snapper for camera calibration and Canten Mapper for projection mapping, just to name a couple. Uh, he and I have worked on a number of projects together, but one of the more recent ones was the uh, creation of the laser shop. Is that about right, Marcus? Yeah, lasers. Lasers <laughs> and web, uh, web stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. As the, um, yeah. And, um, oh, and right, and you also did um, Bullet, which we'll be uh, talking Bullet. about to today. Bullet. Yeah. 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 And above me is Isabel, and you all know Isabel, I'm assuming, because Isabel is in charge of the, uh, um, all the communications and um, a little bit like stirring up the community. So uh, you definitely have seen and heard of her before, as well as you do have your own, uh, your own you have uh, another show, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted have to say a, a side show, but it's not a side show. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's, it's a side show. Yes, the community campfire and uh, uh, Roy, Roy Gerritsen of, uh, and, and, and Tim Gerritsen, and, uh, but mostly Roy really, uh, really created this beautiful environment uh, for the community campfire chat. And we've done one, one show and uh, another one coming soon. So. Uh, I should have yes. had a URL here, but you're basically you're broadcasting this on Twitch currently, right? And yes. It's twitch.tv slash community camp community. but maybe Roy can put it in. Roy Roy can put it in the chat. Into the chat, yes. Roy is Please here. Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, so um so just as usual, let's talk a little bit of what in session actually is. I can scroll, Isabel, you can talk if you want. Oh, um, well, In Session is a, um, our main show where uh, it sort of originated from the idea of having an open office where people would call in with touch designer problems. But we kind of modded it a bit. It started again during, um, during um, quarantine and the time that we were all sort of isolated. And uh, so basically, every, every three weeks, we have the show where uh, if you go to Touch Designer slash In Session, um, you can learn more about it. And there's a form to fill out. And uh, basically, you send your network and project and questions. And, uh, and then you come on the show. And our developers spend uh, some time uh, um, working, working on the project and, uh, you know, improvements and... Uh, and uh, 
optimization and so on and so forth. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. It would be really nice to hear of or to see projects sent in. Um, you can just go to derivative.ca slash in session, which has a link at the bottom, the registration form where you can submit your projects. And we'll be having a look and um, we'll be, a, we're a little bit um, picking up what we can take on and what not. And uh, we're trying to do one or two participants a week. Um, a week? Yeah. Sorry, every three, four weeks, something yes. like this. <laughs> and, and guys, don't be shy. Like, you yeah. know, su submit your work because uh, we're not scary. It's not scary. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and Harvey's laughing. <laughs> so uh, so definitely go to this page and check out the form and just send us send us something. Yeah, I think um, mostly we are scared. We are scared. <laughs> <laughs> also partially because um, in the heat uh -huh. here we are running all of this and. Um, Although it looks quite okay right now, <laughs> my computer is still doing okay. Um, yes, so um, so maybe with that, yeah, so derivative.ca slash session, it's really easy URL to remember, and then registration form at the bottom, submit, and we'll be in touch with you. And maybe with that, we'll um, have introduce Harvey. Harvey. Ah, uh, Harvey, Harvey, yes. Uh, I think I think this is my my favorite my favorite artist uh, artist about about uh, introduction ever video <laughs> and uh, and the statement. Thanks for joining us, Harvey. Super nice that uh, you're here with us. Great to be here. I love your earrings. Oh, I know. I'm. Look uh, at this bananas. <laughs> uh, who gave these to me? Uh, Andrew Quinn. Andrew Quinn gave these to me oh, at so the Touch Designer Summit. So yes. Um, so Harvey, you're a new media artist and creator of tools and machines, and uh, and you seem to have a, an incredible and very fortunate relationship with technology, right? <laughs> I mean, in the 10 years that we've known each other, first at Leviathan and then at Obscura Digital, you've always seemed to have, have had access to the latest and coolest emerging technology, <laughs> you know, trackers, scanners, robots, plotters. Um, so can you can you take us back a little bit, uh, back a little bit in time past that, and tell us a bit about your practice and how you orchestrate all this, uh, all this for good fortune. Yeah, for sure. I, I guess I've been pretty lucky to encounter all these different things in my time, starting with Leviathan, really, and kind of my mentor at the time, Matthew Daly, uh, introduced me to Touch Designer, and I think anyone that uses this program like knows how easy it is to interoperate and connect things together. And so, you know, uh, just out of the box, all of the things that you can start to plug in and work with really just starts to open up a whole world. And that excitement really has carried me on the past 10 years, uh, continuing to use Test Designer and all the fun things that I can put together in like a weekend. So a lot of the stuff that I get excited about, it's more of like a sprint and I'll be like, okay, I can do this. I know how to do this in two days. I'm just going to throw it together. And wow. it ends up being something, just like a glimmer of something interesting that I can evolve into something else. And, you know, with Touch Designer, you just build up these skill sets over time. Um, but I really, like the reason why I just keep coming back to Touch is that it's just so quick to get these ideas out. And right you know, plug something in and get going with it. And uh, for me, it's always about the final output. It's not really about how you get there. Um, just just while we have that video on the screen, what can you can you explain a bit what, what, what actually is going on there? Oh, here? Okay. Yeah. So um, we did this project for Burning Man, and it was a bunch of, like, different LEDs and control systems. And while we were putting it together, I collaborate with this musician, um, and so him and I had been working on the TDU Ableton side, and I was building this light system for Burning Man. And so the obvious thing was to just put these together one night. So we had him <laughs> over for a weekend. Um, he brought his keyboard. He brought Ableton. And it didn't take 20, 30 minutes to connect wow. the system with the lights we had running and TDU Ableton. And in one way or another, like, get these things to talk together. So, right. um, you know, it's more about being creative than it is about messing with 
how how do these pieces work? You know, how sure. does it come together? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is more of like what you your team has been doing behind the scenes, so that I'm not worried about it anymore. But um, good, good, because yeah. worrying is worrying is uh, pointless. <laughs> so, so, so basically, <laughs> I mean that, that that's kind of what stands out with your work. It's sort of like these rapid R and D sessions, right? Where you just you uh, you have access to a tool, or you have you're inspired by a, a technology, or have an idea and Touch designer is kind of the, the, the facilitator and the, uh, um, well, the way you realize it. Yeah, so I guess, like, personally, what keeps me going is all of these sort of uh, quick, interesting uh, new technologies and techniques and, like, ways to apply them and all of that stuff. Um, but, you know, my, my, like, company with MB Labs is more right. about making it, you know, applying these things to something more permanent and like making exactly. it real. Um, but you know, what, what keeps me going is, is sort of the excitement of what's next and what's coming yeah. up. And so, so what right now, is there anything that kind of particularly excites you in terms of, uh, what we're doing, where we're going, whether it's technology or community or, uh, I mean, Oh, broad, I, broad I mean, question, I'm always excited. Broad. I'm so excited all the time. Marcus and I were just chatting a little bit before about uh, different calibration techniques and using like uh, checkerboard sort of, oh, that didn't work at all with the background subtraction. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, some checkerboard <laughs> patterns for calibrating projectors. And um, I'm, I'm definitely excited to like continue and, and see where the community grows. And it's really kind of exciting, like the past three to five years, like what's been happening and uh, yes. all the different additions that have been happening at Touch Designer. Like I, I really got started in 66. And so, um, in, in, sorry, in, in 066. Oh, six. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Um, right, so right. Like before we were even, you know, Python was just getting in and like getting it integrated into Touch Designer. And so just to see where things have been in the past 10 years is mm -hmm. really inspiring. Uh, mm -hmm, for sure. Just uh, things are definitely speeding up. That's uh, that's that's a given. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about why you're here today and uh, what we're oh, going yeah. to be working on? For sure. So, I made a little example. I've been working with a bunch of the OpenCV stuff that's been included recently in Touch Designer, and um, wanted to integrate that with some of the other physics things that are also new and. All of this was really new to me, and so the I made this little example, and in doing so, encountered a lot of sort of weird edge cases and had to build a lot of kind of hacky band-aids to get it to work. Um, but it, it seemed like a pretty simple project, so I felt like it was a good example uh, to see if I could get some help on and um, probably introduce me to some techniques that I never would have thought about before. Um, and then maybe something the community would like too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned uh, maybe uh, open sourcing it or. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, it's really just a few operators put together. But of I wanted to, like, like the underlying techniques can end up being used in a lot of different ways for other people, and yeah. um, I think it'd be really cool. I think so too. So. Uh, Thank you for joining us, and I'm going to turn sure. it over to uh, Marcus and Eric. And uh, I'll be looking at uh, your looking for your questions in the chat and relaying them uh, to people who are watching. So, take it away. Yeah, perfect. Um, let's have a look at what you sent in. So basically, just to um, I mean, I just showed the video. Maybe just to go back, um, Isabel, you're going to be on the screen for a second again. Oops, no, don't do that. Again. Um, so what you, have, what you have is um, a projection onto a desk and seemingly the, uh, um, the elements that are floating in from the, from the ceiling there are being um, inter, interject, interjected, interrupted. Uh, you basically have those objects on your desk that are then interacting with the uh, projection itself. Um, this is kind of the uh, underlying idea of the whole thing. And Except everything everything has to be black. 
yeah so i yeah i guess in this technique it's using like a threshold so it's just looking for things that are opposite of the background and using that to generate a geometry yeah yeah the uh, yeah you're thresholding the uh, um well i guess i can just move this to the side here and uh go into your file so what's happening is you are um taking a camera image and cropping out a section that you're interested in with a little um, corner pinner and then you're sending this um, into a thresholding process where you're thresholding the element or the, uh, um, the, yeah, the object. So you could theoretically go other colors as well if you would like to. It's not thresholding, but um, I don't know, by chroma keying or something. And um, that then is being used by OpenCV to uh, um, <coughs> pick out uh, contours and the contours are then being converted into uh, um, actors for bullet system which uh, base physics here Let's see I hope I'm not uh, well which um, then eventually damn it I was wondering if that would happen to me let me just restart that um, you, so you're creating actors from these uh, contours and um, then uh, you're letting some uh, stuff fall down and bounce off these things. So I just gotta restart quickly. Sorry about this. Oh, that's good. Eric's taking over. Um, there we go. Yeah, so... Um yeah, you're showing inside here face physics. So yeah, yeah. here's the place, and you have a, a set number of actor components here that you you, f you 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 create the contours with however many you need, and then you deactivate the ones that you don't need, basically. Yeah, I found that generating actors dynamically when new items were detected in the camera space wouldn't be recover or received in the uh, in the flex solver. So the physics wouldn't recognize an actor if it wasn't there when the physics system was initialized. Uh, right, yeah, so um, Marcus and I uh, worked on a solution to this really so that you don't, you, because of the fact that you're using a compound collision shape with your contours, you can actually build them up into a single actor component We're using just a single collision shape. And uh, Marcus came up with something using cloning inside of the actor component that will clone up the number of contours using a geometry component. And inside of it, he, he uh, uh, does something I, with the, the data from OpenCV, and he can, he can talk about that a bit more. Yeah, so it's a little bit, um, it's crashing, it's a little bit crashy because of the, uh, um, Eric, I think you had to look at it and you found that the, uh, uh, um, yeah, that the yeah. Uh, extrude, extrude stuff, stuff is not happy with the constantly changing um, number of points or changing geometry, basically. So yeah, so all the instability in the file right now comes from the the extrude stop. Yeah, and you, you you have a solution that avoids that, or at least works around that as well, right, Marcus? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of the overview of the whole project, and uh, we thought we'll go from left to right, like from start to end a bit, um, perhaps starting with the OpenCV part and looking a little bit at the, uh, um, at the script that you have here, what we can do there. Um, and yeah, as you, you mentioned in your file as well, that uh, is this necessary? Like, do you, ha do you actually have to do certain things in OpenCV or can you do them directly in touch? Because what you're doing is you're doing a thresholding here and you're getting a binary image out with a black and white image. So perhaps um, and some of these things are not necessarily uh, required in OpenCV anymore and you can save some, um, some computing time. Although I think this is really quick, like the CD2 convert color where you take a color image and convert it into a grayscale image. I think that almost um, I have I've not timed any of these things, but it's pretty much um, almost for free. 
similar, um, the threshold doesn't seem to be too uh, expensive. But as you're already doing this here, um, what you can actually do, and let's just go from top to bottom here, you're grabbing um, an input frame and um, you're doing this with the NumPy array method that's available for each top. So if you have a top and you want to get the uh, values of the pixels into a NumPy array, which then would be compatible with OpenCV functions, you can do um, top.numpy array. And um, this causes, and this is very similar to, uh, um, to the top to chop, chop, uh, or the top to chop. Um, this causes a frame hang because it has to download the uh, data from the uh, GPU and then um, get it onto the CPU. Uh, there, is a, there is a method here which is delayed equals true, which does the same thing as in the uh, chop to top, which is delaying the whole delivery method by one frame. I think in the um, top two chop, it's called, let's see, uh, it's called next frame, fast. Um, so this would be delayed equals true, would give you the same thing during the next frame. Now, that means that your initial frame is not available. The first time you run this, you will not get anything out of it. Um, so one thing you can actually do is, since you are running this script on a timer, um, you can prep the first frame, for example, in the initialize call here. So you could say here, um, oh, what is it? Now input frame uh, dot numpy array delayed equals true. And um, so when, when this initializes, you basically get your first frame. And then every time you call this script, you're going to get um, a delayed frame, but it comes without the, uh, um, the waiting time for waiting for downloading the frame from the GPU to the CPU. Cool. So um, I was actually able to um, then do this every two frames, basically, with the timer. You could cool. also run this in an of execute and run this on uh, every yeah. frame then if you wanted to. Um, yeah, so there was another change here. I basically set the uh, um, I set the timer length to um, two frames. And awesome. Um, the cycle, you would have to turn the cycle on without the cycle limit. And on done, because you're never done, uh, do nothing. And then um, instead of calling this function on done, I would be calling it um, on um, on cycle start. So yeah, call that here. So this basically makes it possible to get a frame in time without uh, much overhead. Awesome. And then the next thing is that this little thing here, this um, list. Uh, or array uh, function here is basically there so that you, uh, what NumPy array returns to you is an RGBA, um, an RGBA uh, array. So it has four vectors for red, green, blue, and alpha. Um, and the three here indicates that you're getting um, uh, that you're getting um, RGB only. Now, since we're already dealing with a binary image, it's only black and white, what we can do here is we can just fetch, for example, the red channel or something, um, or the first channel, and um, yeah, now you have, now you only have your alpha channel or your red channel, which is binary as well. So that's perfect. Uh, you still have to convert it to a uint8, I believe. But you do not have to convert from color to gray. You do not have to threshold the whole thing. So you can go straight into the control found finder here with the CV image, um, Yeah, which now 
Uh, let's see, initialize start. So yeah, this now fetches a frame every um, every frame. Oh, sorry, every two frames. Um, or contour. And then what you're doing um, next was that you're basically writing out. Uh, maybe I should unlock this here. I guess we have to do some uh, thresholding later on there. But um, what you're doing then is you're looking at the contour and all, at all the contours that it can find, and you're writing out uh, the points for the contours as well as um, the vertices or the point indexes, right? Like you have a table all points, which is all the points, and then table path, which is a collection of um, which is a collection of points per path. Yeah, so this is kind of the first hacky part, where because I I couldn't generate um, dynamic actors. I had to reset the actors to be something. So I gave the inactive actors just a zero, one, two, three, like kind of like a dummy positions. So at least it had a quad to like form a SOP, even oh, if it was inactive. Okay. I guess, um, yeah. But everything else was then generating the SOP based off of the points and paths, you know, of. Uh, each of the contours. And there's one thing um, what Eric explained to me was that um, you do not necessarily have to create separate actors. You can mm -hmm. have an actor, and I think you have it set to this actually, you set it to a compound shape. So this collision shape compound can actually be multiple shapes. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be a single um, uh, shape. could be already the uh, Sum of all the shapes. Um, yeah, you could. Yeah, you can make it a, a sum of all of your contours instead of separating each contour into its own actor component. And the way that you did this was basically you're selecting all the points with an add sub, and then um, that's very nice use of the polygons tab on the add sub. You're using the polygons table to uh, um, to then create the shape from that. Uh, which is very nice. Uh, I like that. The uh, the um, a different approach to this would be that we are trying to. Uh, there was actually one point also in your email was that you often get then a shape that might have 300 points, but not necessarily you need those 300 points. You wanted also to restrict that a little bit. And um, an idea was what we could do is. I'm just going to use a base comp here to explain that process. We could essentially take a circle, or sorry, we'll take a tube because we need a three-dimensional object where those um, where those other actors can bounce off from, and we make this pointing in the z direction. Uh, we could change the detail a little bit because the tube has more points than we necessarily need. Oh, sorry, uh, let's just look at wireframe here. Um, we have all these rows here, so we just need two rows and 40 columns. And um, then we could use, theoretically, or that's the idea here, is then to use a chop 2 sub to uh, offset these points to the position of the shapes that you get, or the contours that you get. Now, they come with all kinds of different number of points. And this is where the chop 2 sub might help, because the chop 2 sub has a mapping setting. And the mapping is, by default, one sample to each point. So you would have to give it 40 points, and then, um, and then um, get the, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just getting, just getting told that um, it looks like Eric is talking all the time, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so you would need basically uh, uh, 40 points always, or in this case, 80 points always, to update the shape properly. But then the second mapping setting here is resample chop to fit sub. 
So this means you can give this actually, and let me just try this here, if I take a pattern, um, and let's make three channels here, Tx, Ty, Tz, oh actually, let's not take Tz, and um, let's offset each face a little bit there. Not sure what's going to come out. And I'm going to double this because in a tube I have basically the same uh, TX, TY positions twice. Um, so uh, I set that here, channel, cycle, cycle, that's good. And now with the trim I can extend the lengths um, relative to start end. I set the end to fraction and to one and now I double this up. Oh and I forgot about that. Now I can use this here and despite me he having here two thousand samples, um it it basically resamples the chop to fit the source geometry. Mm. So you can always limit it to this forty or eighty points basically, making it a stable geometry. Um, uh, including um, now you don't need to do since we now already have a tube you don't even need to do any extrudes or trims or um, whatever else we had to do previously this just works uh, I never would have thought of that as is. so um, so if, if you change that pattern to like a noise what is does that just make a noisy edge yeah it looks a little bit uh, noisy there. Oh, I see. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but that, that my, that's actually some of the contours that are coming in. <laughs> they look a little bit like that. So, um, uh, yeah, and I see these. But then these are all relative to the centroid of each shape, right? Um, yeah. Like the pattern is sort of a, a, it's relative to the center of your tube. Um, no, because the contours, and you can see that in a bit, the contours are actually giving you pixel positions, right? Uh, pixel positions in the uh, in the image that that OpenCV is grabbing. Yeah. And then it's offsetting the circle because then these values would be uh, um, these values would be offset as well. Uh, it just creates it exactly mm. where you create it, or where the contour gotcha. is in the image. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. So this would be the idea. Now, the the thing for that to work is we need all the TX and TYs somehow for each shape in a in a single table, and um, that was the thing that uh, we could change then here uh, in the initial script, where um, basically we could create another table. Um, let's say we uh, create a table here. Table dot. Sorry, I do have my notifications on, so everybody sees my notifications. People, be aware what you're sending me right now. <laughs> everybody can see that. I'm not going to try to fix that. Uh, after TY. Whoops. So it would be a table with ID for the contour and TX, TY for the, um, <laughs> for the points. Table uh, uh, with points. Sure. Good. So now we need to fill this table and we can do this in the script here. Um, Let's just say point table is uh, and for every run through we'll clear out this table. Get clear, uh, but keep first row equals true, so we don't lose the header. And then we would have to now uh, see what we're doing with this looping. So. 
There's a couple things as well. You are basically fetching the first 20 contours. Um, and one thing with the OpenCV thing is with the, um, with the fine contours is that the first contour it creates is actually the outer image, like the, yeah. the image frame. Um, but we can get totally rid of that. Uh, by Since those are all arrays, we can say contours equals contours uh, start at the second and take whatever is there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, the other thing is you're trying to uh, limit the number of contours. I think that was also because of the uh, number of actors you had created. Um, yes. And theoretically, we can also just clip the contours by saying uh, contours um, 20. Yeah. So we just get, so we get rid of the first one, which is the frame, and uh, we keep the rest um, if it's 20 or not. Um, yeah. So then we can now we now we already have. Um, viable contours basically and we can loop through them for contour in contours um, um, yeah oh actually you know what it's actually a good idea what I see here what you're doing is you're also checking the length of the contour so you want to have some detail is that like was that an experience that was yeah I I think one of the things I was thinking was that some of the contours were really tiny specks or like for one frame, maybe a shadow would in, would create a very tiny contour. And right. I wanted some way to like disregard tiny things that would pop in and out of the frame. So this was sort of another band-aid to try and get rid of the crashing. And uh, the assumption that I made was that really tiny contours we're enabling and disabling actors very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and so I tried to limit, and there might be something more in OpenCV that can tell you to avoid certain contour sizes or, uh, you know, to limit the output to. But I, I think that's what I was doing, is just checking the length of the number of points in that contour and making sure that it was actually a reasonable sized object. Right. Um, yeah. Because it, it actually ends up putting a lot of points in each contour, like too many points. Yeah. Um, so if it had at least 10, I knew it was a, a real shape. There is the contour area that you have here as well. Um, this thing here, which you could use if you know approximately uh, if, yeah. if a contour is too small, you could That's true. possibly um, get it out this way. That's probably um, better. Um, so, I'm, now I'm unsure about the threshold uh, of these contours, but uh, yeah, you could basically, for every, for every contour here, if um, cv2.contour area, um, contour, I don't know if that makes any sense. 10 is probably a little too small. 100 would be 10 by 10 pixels, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's pixel dimensions. Um, or let's say if it's greater than this, then continue on. And um, we probably need something like a counter to give us an ID. So I'm just going to. Uh, and now if the contour area is greater than 100, we can set the ID to counter. So we get an initial ID here for the thing. And then um, we can do what you're doing down there as well for point in, um, for point in contour. We can basically use the point table and row and add the ID and then the point and this is like 
it's like stacked arrays or something, it's like stuff in stuff. Which I never can remember, I just have to try those things out normally. Um, how many levels down you actually have to go to get to mm -hmm. X and Y. And then outside of this, uh, count of plus equals one. So um, this gives you all the contours that you have. We could still limit this, like we could still say um, if contour area greater 100 and uh, counter smaller 20 or something like this. That should work, I believe. Um, yeah, so this should give you, let's see if that actually works. I'm uh, just going to comment out this here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, aha, four point contour, four point in contour, that would help. Yeah, it's better. And now we just need a proper contour. Um, Okay. I had some thresholding thing in there. Yeah. You? There is some thresholding here. There. Du, du, du. Okay. So now we're getting here a contour with uh, uh, 1,200 points actually. That's that's good. That's a good one. And there was this we can actually try out the uh, um, if we can create that shape properly. But so literally, we're just now filling one table. If I add a second contour into here, um, we should be seeing. Let me just pause this. Uh, we should be seeing multiples. Yeah. So we're seeing two contours, the ID 0 and 1. So that works. Cool. Now, would you still prefer to fill a table with that? I like guess that intermediary. I thought if it's going to be in a yeah. it's going to be in a chop, right? Yeah. I mean, um, personally, I do like making things visible. It might be a question of can we uh, um, can we get better speed by, for example, saving this into, uh, if we would write an extension, for example, and then write this into a property or something like this, and to a dependable property, perhaps, where we could fetch it from, or into storage, that might be quicker. But um, then we could grab it from a, um, then we could grab it from a script shop, perhaps, um, yet I kind of like it visual, like I have something to uh, check if this is okay or not. Um, yeah. So here in my base one that I prepared before, I would just... Uh, oh, actually, no, nothing here. Now we need to replicate this base one depending on how many contours we have. So here we would have to fetch that table. Um, and we can do it like this, but... Uh, parent dot three. We can also use parent dot project. Something that I got really used to for using like the um, the uh, parent shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So everything. Yeah. yeah, I noticed like lately it fills in a different value. If you have a global shortcut, it'll fill in the global shortcut. It seems to prefer a relative path mm. sometimes. Yeah. Like. Like, is there a way to designate how it fills in that automatically, or you just sort of have to edit it? I am um, actually, I'm not too sure. I think it's most. I it might. I hardly use global up shortcuts, so I'm right now. That's uh, I don't know. It usually fills in something like this, like parent yeah. and then the levels. Um, I just then usually change it to parent and uh, parent shortcut. Yeah to make that a little bit simpler. Yeah, it's really useful to start um, putting uh, parent shortcuts to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It just keeps it a little bit uh, more sane. I always get confused with the how many levels are three levels up and stuff. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so how do I find out how many contours there are? Well, I can use the sort dot for this. Because the sort dot gives me the possibility to use unique output, uh, single row column, um, which basically matches then the first column, makes it unique. So now I know, oh, okay, there's two different um, IDs here. If I take this out, this one, put it back in. I guess nobody can see what I'm actually doing. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, there. Uh, I'm adding I'm adding more stuff into the camera view. Perhaps I should put this in two. And we've got three contours here. So that's the idea. Um, so this would be my... Uh, now... Contours. I'm just going to add a null here for points. And with this, I can already create a replicator here. Use this as my, the contours as my template dot. Uh, ignore first row, sure, we can use, call this item, that's fine. And we can use this. Um, we'll just call it contour mask of um, one. Why add this one? I'll explain in a second. And use this as the uh, uh, master operator here. And so now it created an item one. And I'm just going to go ahead and delete these here, these actors. Open. We'll use them later again. Okay. You can't move that. Can't move that <laughs> as much as I want to. <laughs> um, right, so that's good. Now, um, yeah, I can make this a clone of itself. The idea here is that if it creates it itself, it makes it a clone of the contour one. And inside, just to remember, now I gotta fetch these points here. Go here. Uh, get a select. Okay, I'm getting lazy and dirty because I'm not using parent shortcuts right now. Um, and then uh, we'll keep the first row for ID TXTY, but we only need TXTY columns, TXTY, and for rows, we'll just select um, the ID, sorry, I should leave this in, I just want the ID, um, well, it's one because it creates item one because it's the first row index, so I'm going to create, um, I'm going to look here via an expression for parent dot digits minus one and this will just retrieve uh, id zero from here by values gives me txty um, and we are 20 seconds in the future let's skip and this will be my null uh, point which i now can convert into a chop to chop that we have to create the output channel per column uh, first row is the names first column is already values and you have my TX and now you can see how much that is changing with every like, um, I mean it's between 140 150 or something like this and the nice thing now is um, yeah I have to extend this uh, if we look at this channel, and we can see that the uh, um, it's holding on each end the last value, but because I want to um, trim it and uh, cycle these values, because for a tube I have the same values twice, uh, for Tx and Ty, um, I need to um, make use of the cycle chop here, um, where I can tell it Oh, not cycle, sorry. The extension. I think Greg was saying join. Join, 
Oh, sure, yeah, that would work as well, actually. Because they would That's smooth true. the edges, right? Um, I just going to mention. I that. think he he chimed in the in the chat on that earlier. That's good. Yeah, I don't see the chat, so this is good. We'll try this in a second. I'll just for for people who don't know the extent chop, you can basically tell it how the channel should operate outside this current range. So I'm just going to pause this here as a comparison. Here I have hold on both ends, like the the first value is held and before in the left behavior and the last value is held in the right behavior and if I um, then use the extent I can say okay so outside my range it should cycle so um, uh. the values always cycle and then also some other stuff like mirror or whatever but we oh. really need cycle here and then I would use I basically uh, I didn't think about the join that's really good um, I was using the trim chop. Well, actually, that's already here. So uh, I can plug this into the trim. And now I have my waveform twice. Mm. And this is now added to the shape. And this shape cool. has 80 points constant. Like this is not, this yeah. is not changing in any way. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a join. Yeah, join is good. Um, let's add a join. I think you said join twice. You just drop it into the same. Yeah, you can two do this, two uh, lines into the same. Yeah, because that should smooth out their their join position, right? Like. I actually don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows everything. Uh, Instead of trim chop, use join chop with two inputs from pattern. Right. I have that, and then <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Method shape. I've used it maybe once or twice. With it. Yeah. Is it print? No, no, no. I've been doing some open CV studying, and um, the one thing that I came across is that they always want you to change values in the code, and it's so annoying to have to change values. While here you can just like, oh, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? How does it work? Mm -hmm. No, I cannot get this to work right now, so I'm just going to leave it with the trim chop. No worries. All um, good. Which is two extra ones, but it works as well. And um, yeah, so this one should be already creating our shape here. Uh, oh, yep, that works. And now um, we need to create this. Uh, yeah, so now what do we do? We uh, we have two actors here now. I just, you can see this here. I added another one. Um, how do I get those two actors together? We can just use the merge soft and look for item star slash, I should have done this. I should have added an out one here or something like this. Sure, let's use an out, that's nicer. Okay, you also see it in each, and in the merge, um, I should be now getting both of my shapes in one, mm -hmm. and I can put this into an actor, into an actor comp. Gotcha. And the actor comp would have to be a compound object. Um, and it's complaining because we're not creating polygons, right? No. Now you'd want to update. You need to update the collision shape uh, every frame. So you'd want to toggle on update collision shape. Oh, that right. means whenever. That means whenever the underlying collision stops, uh, right. it'll rebuild the whole collision shape. And Mark, Marcus, you may want to save your work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> What happened to that little save pop-up that used to be there eight years ago, every 20 minutes? Anyone remember that? <laughs> um, I think we had a component, right, that did that. Yeah, there used to be a save component reminder that yeah. by default, every 20 minutes would tell you to save your, your, your talks, I guess save your toes. I guess we, 
We should just make it a little <laughs> notification instead of a blocking thing. Like a, uh, we should have like the Microsoft. Um, oh, clippy? Greg says the join is broken. The join is broken. Okay. Clippy, you mean? Yeah, I love the clippy idea. <laughs> let's let's do it. Bring it back. And, and then save your work. Anyway. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. So we do have that. Now, um, let's backtrack a little bit, actually. So this is the one idea. Um, we, we, prevent, we prevent the necessity of your question here that we have um, dynamically created actors. We just have one actor, and we keep updating the collision shape. Um, this works pretty well. And without changing the point numbers, this system seems to be a, a stable. Okay, um, I didn't get any crashes. Uh, but, uh, I'm just safe, uh, having said that. Um, so, yeah. So, okay, we're creating shapes from whatever OpenCV is giving us here. And so then I had a look a little bit at uh, what we're doing here. So you're corner pinning, and it's a good idea. Like, you're basically cropping out the area of, your, uh, of the piece of paper that you want to analyze in OpenCV. Um, a problem that I had with, or when, when doing this, the problem I uh, came across was that the that it's basically a deformed um, image after cropping it like this, because it's mapping, mapping this irregular uh, rectangle into a rectangle again. Mm -hmm. So um, while that might save us a couple of uh, a couple of cycles with OpenCV, I thought what we also could do is we could actually threshold the whole thing first and then crop out the area that we want to send to uh, to OpenCV but or like crop out anything outside of uh, like my hands or anything after the thresholding. Um, it might just because then we stay. What OpenCV creates is it gives you the contour points per um, like in its image uh, space. So if we can stay in the camera space of it all, then it would give us the pixel coordinates in camera space and I thought maybe that's a little bit easier to uh, work with. Although I mean you could start using um, homographies to uh, to figure out the real point positions I guess. Um, since you have, like with homographies what you can do, um, you have the four points of your crop but you know that this is a rectangle so you can um, you can create uh, it creates a matrix the OpenCV find homography function it creates basically a transformation matrix from this rectangle to the uh, um, as if it would be really a rectangle mm -hmm. but um, I feel that's a little bit complicated so if um, what I did instead was taking your threshold yeah, I stop this for now, and I just threshold the whole thing, and then <coughs> instead of extracting, I'm uh, corner pinning these values here. So, uh, yeah, so I just get a. I would basically take this null here and now control the area in pixels that I want to um, send to OpenCV. So this could be... Uh, sorry, what am I doing here? Yeah. Uh, what 
the left, Px, Ty, Px, Ty. Oh, sorry, I'm doing this, obviously, I should be doing this with uh, um, top left, Px, with a white image, and then multiply that with the output of your threshold. Okay, export. Okay. So if I do this with a white background, I'm just going to create a constant top here. Doom -doom, like this. Now I can multiply. Um, where are you here? this area with this. So now I only have the area that I want to um, analyze. And then I have to over this or I could I guess I could use a transform or something like this. And then um, this might be a little bit big for OpenCV perhaps 640 by 480. We can use a smaller one so I can scale this down with uh, resolution, for example, make this half the resolution, and uh, pass this on to OpenCV. Um, all in the effort, I, OpenCV has to do a little bit more work now, because what uh, you did was just grab these pixels here, so that's a smaller area, while I am now working on the full frame. But I'm staying in the camera frame, which I kind of liked. Uh, it's probably debatable. I'm not sure um, what you think about that. I guess it, it means that the perspective from the projector has to stay, like the perspective of the effect has to stay from that angle, right? Like you're not normalizing to like the 2D. I guess I need to see what you're, you're doing. Right, yeah, the, uh, the last step in here, I mean, you have um, your corner pinning or you're stoning the, the final result onto the piece of paper um, in the end. And um, what I did in the end was I made use of this camera feature called um, Quad Reproject Sop. Ah, okay. Where I'm creating the Sop with the, so I'm, I'm completely staying in camera space. Here. Yeah. So I'm using your corner pin values to create the sub that gotcha. I want to use as the quad reproject. And um, well, um, it is in camera space, so it looks correct from the camera, <laughs> from the video, from the webcam. Um, yeah. To do this completely correct. Um, you would have to do what you've been doing as well in a different project where you calibrate um, this area to the camera mm -hmm. and then calibrate the projector to the camera as well. Then you could get it um, correct from the projector space. Yeah. Um, I thought because everybody's going to see it from the camera, <laughs> the trick thing, yeah. and uh, have this uh, is that. Um, yeah, so uh, we have an input frame here. Um, and yeah, so I didn't need um, I didn't need to make use of the uh, find uh, resolution or any of those things anymore. Um, I could leave this out. We could also, oh, well, they're still in the script. I'm not going to clean up the script now, just for it. Um, and this brings us a little bit back into the whole realm of the bullet solver. Um, to look at a at a different thing here, I'm going to split my screen just to have a good look at the bullet solver. Uh, We'll have a look at the geometry view here to look what's happening. Um, so they're all falling down and then they 
to jump back up and start falling down again. Um, and you're doing this by taking the bullet solver chop attached to the bullet solver comp and then run a script on the ty so you're looking basically in this little component you're looking um, how many of them are below or if there's any of them above zero right on the ty axis or something yes and that triggers a script which yeah since all of the all of the interactable elements were above zero yeah. If any of the balls went below the visible area, I just reset the simulation. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's that's fine. You can also, and this is the fun part here about the bullet solver of one parameter, which is the feedback chop. If you use the feedback chop, then you can control certain behaviors with or overwrite. Uh, I guess you would say overwrite. Yeah overwrite things that you're getting from the bullet solver chop. So you have uh, TX, TY, TZ, the position of each actor. You can also get um, velocities and things like this. And so you can start uh, controlling position. So I did try using a math chop after yeah. that. Um, I'm sorry, like a limit chop after yeah. that with the limit on the Y axis. But the gravity increases exponentially, and there's, you know, it just gets faster and faster. Right. Um, yeah. Really, you'd want to reset their position individually, uh, and I just decided to kind of keep it easy. But it would, it would, uh, like, if you could in independently uh, reset each one, then they would become more dynamic over time if it's yeah. interacting with things. Yeah. So you could. You could probably do this on collision if you add a collision plane or something like this. Um, we can try. You could do that with the. You could do it with the feedback chop as well. Whenever it reaches the end of the limit, then you can. When you put it back at the top, you set the velocity to. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the ty velocity. Right. So you would get the. Uh, um, you have a grid in here, so we could get the. Um, let me just flip this a little bit more. Flip top bottom. So I guess you could get the position via the original position relative. Um, do we have IDs? Oh yeah, we've got uh, body IDs. And so then, if uh, ty goes below zero. We could get the buddy ID and then with a lookup fetch the TX, TY and move it to that. Yeah. So let's start maybe with the uh, with the simple thing. What um, what I did was exactly what you said, like loop it and uh, only on the TY axis and to prevent the um, to prevent from it increasing indefinitely. I um, also control or limited the velocity um, of it as well. And just to show people how that would work, so I'm limiting ty. Probably should limit it between what do we have here? Something 2,300 and maybe um, let's say minus 10 and 2,300 or something. And reference this as the feedback chop. Yeah. So now it's looping. And we can watch it go faster and faster now. Speeding up. So one way to get it to a maximum velocity would be by um, limiting all the velocities to a certain a certain value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Minus 100, 100 maybe. And uh, yeah, then it's uh, that would keep it like that. Now, um, to your point, okay, so we want to take a logic chop and get 
all the turn off time slides so you can act on a, a person or on the whole channel basically and then look at only ty and say um, sure off point zero or less that's perfect actually um, so off point zero or less we can flip this around do we actually have that no post up no. math range one to zero so we only get uh, the ty for uh, I need more space here um, only the ty's go up for the ones that are currently below zero or zero or less and now we can select out um, the body ID by multiplying combine chops multiply um, or oh wait no I should use uh, I should use a composite for this eh? yeah I should use a composite for it Okay, so the first input would be um, select, let's see if I can make this work, select ty, that's the current, uh, first input is base source, second one is layer source, would be the ty from my original grid. This is one, I don't, I don't know, did you ever use the composite before? Have you used the composite before? No. Okay, this seems to work. Does it put it into the original? Oh wait, I'm still limiting, sorry. Got a blue Skype screen, okay. Yeah, now, now I'm gonna... Uh, um, oh my bad. Oh okay. Okay, so and I'm now here. replace delete this and replace the original TY with the new TY. That's kind of funny. Are you trying to replace the velocity or the ty? The ty, yeah, it does it. It does it correctly, I think. It builds it up again. Yeah, it puts it back into its original position when mm. it goes below. Interesting. Zero. Yeah. So, I guess you would still. Um, would you select? Uh, um, yeah, I guess you it just would set the velocity to a certain value then as well, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Back to zero. Um, yeah. Why not? Give it. I guess you could also make their starting grid like just a single row um, instead of a tall tower of items to start with. They would be all, I think they would be all bunched up and always coming down the same way until they hit something. Yeah, when you hit something and it starts to, yeah, it'll start to shake up a bit. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, they're staying in their rows pretty consistently. Yeah. So uh, Greg is suggesting that maybe with composite, you could have used the scope channel to affect not only TY yeah. and uh, not have select TY up. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's great, yes. Um, I do not need TY in here. Less ops. Yes. Nice. Right, I guess I could even ah, escape. Do this. 
Battle. Wait, what is it doing now? I think it's I'm moving faster. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll keep two here. I'm gonna swip the operation order. Or did I delete more than I wanted? Strange. Oh, I'm replacing all the channels here. Sorry, because I'm using the replace here. Um, I don't need to replace anymore. Yeah. I was replacing um, everything with everything. Mm. So everything came through the second. Yeah, I see. Uh, composite. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, the, 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 this makes it kind of interesting to work with. The other thing, and we'll, we can have a look at this in a moment, was that um, you also get, once we, once we hit objects here, um, you also see that uh, um, they would be flying off to the site, and you want to prevent them from flying off to the site. So then you could work again with velocity to actually prevent the uh, mm. prevent them from moving out of the frame. And the question would be, why don't I see my shape here? I've got this shape. Where is it? Um, I have my display flag on. That's my actor. Oh, there they are. I had to reinitialize the whole thing. Start simulation. Oh, they're falling. Oh, they're falling. <laughs> so, can't forget to set this to static. And Right, so we are in two different planes here. Um, let's have a look at this. Uh, so the grid is currently set to... Uh, um, I think the tubes just aren't long enough, Marcus. The tubes that you're using for the contours. Yeah, we could do this as well. Or we could have a look as well why the, uh, like what the settings of the grid here is. And uh, you move them out of the way a little bit. Was that a like it just made it work at that point or? Um, it I was extruding and then trying to fit the balls to fit in the center of the extrude. Oh, okay. So, yeah. um, I like I guess the issue there was that you know in camera space it's going to fall in and out and around that shape. Yeah. So, it I mean if you keep it pretty confined to one, you know you basically I want to remove one axis. I don't want to have a, a depth. Right, yeah, and, and you can also do that on the bullet solver component as well. So, if, uh, Marcus, if you go to the bullet solver component, there's the uh, the velocity constraints as well as a drop down for the dimension to use. So, the dimension, it can either be 1D, 2D, or 3D. And though those are basically just shortcuts for the linear multiplier and angular multiplier. So if you go, if you choose dimension 2D, it'll uh, limit it to the xy plane. So it'll in the linear multiplier, it'll essentially put one one zero, and in the angular multiplier, it'll put zero zero one, which means that gotcha. you'll only have you'll only have rotation in the z axis, and you can only move linearly in the x and y, which I think is what you want in your case. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I couldn't get that to work. I think I might have just been in the wrong axis. Um, do you see the actors? So, why don't I see them bouncing off my actors here? Yeah, I had this problem too. I had to move the actors into the B solver. Into the bullet? Weird. I, sometimes. I, sometimes. You know, yeah. me, I don't know. Let me have a look here what I did. You should make sure there aren't any inside of that bullet solver currently. Yeah. Oh, the reason is because the if you look at the actors list on the bolt solver, you're probably not referencing it, right? Is that why? Uh, GOCB actor slash star. Yep. So this is geo. What does it say there? Subs used contain. Oh yeah. No, so now we get there. Yeah. I did have to do this. Yeah. I have to make my tube uh, a polygon tube. 
Mm -hmm. There we go. Right, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh, there you go. There. Yeah. So now we have the problem of it um, bouncing to the side, but that's okay. Um, I guess actually to prevent this, we can also just do um, that we can use later. Mainly, let's see if we can update this properly. Let's uh, initialize and start. Can we see what you're doing on the camera, maybe? Or sure, yeah. I'm trying, oh, maybe I should stop this out to here in a second. Um, here's the output. So I have to work with the thresholds here to get better thresholding, I think. Um, because, oh look, it kind of looks okay. Oh, right, there was another thing, yes. So because I'm working in, in the, uh, in the, um, space of the camera, I can basically render this now as 1920 or whatever you want, uh, 1920 by 1080, and have the camera now set to uh, um, the width of my, um, the width of my frame that I'm analyzing. So the analyzing frame is here. Um, input frame, this thing here. Yeah. This 20, sure. And therefore I can set the parameter here to parent that project that up. Um, oops. Width, or the width from bottom left, um, and then I should be changing my grid as well because my grid now. Let's just set this to zero zero. And then let's change the grid here that is used to um, to on the instance uh, to instance my um, bodies here. Um, let's change this size, and this size I again can set also to my uh, to the image that I'm analyzing, like to the size of the image that I'm analyzing. So the same as the camera, basically, the width would be. And that project that up uh, input frame dot width. The height we can leave there, but now my center would be um, would be the size divided by two. New dot size dot now new dot bar dot size x divided by 2. So I move it a little bit into to the right. And my y would be v dot r dot size y divided by 2. And now I want to offset it, the initial position outside the frame. So I would take again the uh, um, I would take the height of my frame that I'm analyzing. And so it always starts outside the frame, basically. That was the main thing that I wanted to do here. Um, okay, and I need to close my geometry here because my frame rate is 
อีกที่ปีนี้นะครับนี่ which is mostly the fault of all the touch designers I'm running at the moment um, uh, yeah okay oh another thing was yeah that when you you're rendering the you're you're rendering the shape here as as a visual representation and I cannot do this with the yeah. actor because the actor now is a cube, a, a tube, and um, the actor could you, also. Yeah. Could, could you close the tube? Yeah, didn't or would like that, that cause problem? Yeah, it didn't yeah. like that. The actors didn't like that. So I mean, what I did was basically, um, I just made a geometry component. It's pretty lightweight anyway. This part. Yeah. And you wouldn't necessarily need a geometry component because you could um, what you render and what you see versus what's used for the collision stops can be different. Um, I'm not sure what you're using on your actor component. I think you're doing it implicitly using the render and display flags, but you can use the um, the collision stops parameter on the actor component. Oh. Look at that. And then I can render this. Yeah, so you can render what's something different from what the collision shape is. Yeah, that's how I had it before, yeah. I think. Right. Yeah, perfect. So I won't render this. Um, now I can add into here. A circle. Not to double it up. Oh, that should make a difference, but out two. Oops. And um, perfect. And it's rendering. Beautiful. Yeah, nice. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, that's good. So where are all... There they are. I guess we can decrease maybe the size of them a little bit here. Da, 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 da. Oh, what's the detail setting on this? Maybe it's too high. 10 by 10. Nah. Should be fine. Okay, so... Cool. Now, the last part was that um, what I'm looking at, what I'm rendering now, um, if I did this all correct, the way that I'm thinking it would work, is that I'm not rendering the camera frame. But what I really want to render is just the area that I'm projecting onto. So just the... Uh, um, uh, because I would have, otherwise I would have to crop out again the area um, that I don't want to project, as I only want to see the... Uh, um, the paper here itself mm -hmm. and there was the idea that I could take your um, <clears throat> that I could take the corners here that you have and make that into a sock so select and then use that as the reprojection quad. Turn the project there. Use the shuffle. And I'm going way over time, eh? I hope everybody's still, or some people are still there. <laughs> 2.30. 
two, but it's a good project. Uh, no. You're good. You got thirty minutes. Nice. We're like pretty close to the end here. And yeah, exactly. And now um, I have to go to sub out of this. So take a chop two sub. Just TX and TY. Okay. And now use these points I can now use as this quad reprojection sub. Um, just have to make sure that I get the point order correct because we also have to specify the point order on it. I'm just going to activate the points. And, um, oops, quad reprojection, zero. One, two, three, save. And now I should be rendering something that looks right. Ah, uh, cool. I'm not sure if that's right, though. Maybe. I mean, I see what it's supposed to be doing, doing. though. <laughs> uh, uh, wait. Oh. Oh, well, there's, well, I'm not sure if that's, um, oh. I definitely have to transform this. The, the, these uh, points, the corner pin points are still in full camera space, but then to make it a little bit easier for OpenCV, I uh, put the resolution, like took half the mm. resolution. Yeah. So I should do this here, 0 0.5. Um, Hmm. Hmm. Not what I thought I'm creating here. Where is my error of thinking? Because it should be rendering on the whole uh, rectangle, basically. Mm -mm -mm -mm. What did I do? <laughs> yeah, I never used that quad and reproject. Uh, I wonder if I'm, I'm the wrong. Yeah, for David's question, I am working in camera space, but I think Marcus is assuming they're close enough. And we're also looking from camera space, so for you guys, it won't matter. Right, I made it. Uh, uh, this is utterly confusing to me now. Um, I made it that the uh, um, it looks correct from the video camera, basically. It but in real life, you're in right. Real life, it it, it should be in projector space. Yeah. In real life, it should be from projector space, yeah. But if they're like pretty close, then it's not much of a change. You can mush it together. Right. 
yeah, which is not necessarily my setup here. They're basically on opposite sides of the. Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> Actually, let me try something. Greg says you're using the opposite use of quad re project. The opposite. Yeah, it should get me into exactly where I want to, I thought. But let me just give this one more try and then I. Uh, And this does look better. It's the way that I built the that I built the rectangle, the point the point uh, order mm. of the rectangle um, was wrong. Okay, yeah. So here we get here we get a view from the camera, basically from the video camera. So now. Um, Taking all of this, and perhaps I should put this into the background. Turn on the projector. I think that's output zero one two. Mm. Might get a little bit louder now. Are you still interested all this map? Yeah, it's one two for a sec. Yeah. Okay. No. Um sorry what are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, the scene is still in the game. Okay. Or, um, hmm. Uh, let's see if can if I'm sure it was for basically what we do now is we use the uh, um basically now uh first bit is this to the per one page. Gotcha. Cool. And that makes it much easier. So they're falling from obviously now everything is in reverse. So uh, <laughs> oh you can see that here. Wait, there. Actually, navigating these corners is a little bit difficult. Yeah, I had a switch so you could set it to a constant to ah. get the corner. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. Where am I? No, yeah, this is this one. When it's out, corner pin. <laughs> yeah. But now the interesting thing though is that you've already used sort of the corners of the paper to build this render. So it should just match perfectly to the paper. It should, yeah, that was the, uh, sorry, I'm totally confused with my point. Yeah, if you go into perform mode, you can see there's like an output, it'll show you the live feed reprojected. Reprojected, okay. Well, let me try this here. I think now I've got my point order correct. Um, there. It's totally in funny directions, I think, but. And where am I? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay, yeah, this should be, this should be done with uh, markers and, um, and calibration. That would make uh -huh. questions, yeah. Perhaps we can meet next week and just do it again. <laughs> In three weeks. <laughs> and get this uh, correct. Okay. Cool. 
So now, is it actually, it's flying through, eh? I am not correct here. I think it might be flipped. I might be flipped, yeah. Um, I just flipped the frame, right? Um, I'm not sure, because it's all scoot and funny. I see, yeah. Okay. I probably have to be... Uh, But it, it, yeah. Nope, still playing through. All right, if you go in a perform mode real quick, and then there's a, a tab you can switch it to the feed to see what it's expecting. So, um, oh, wait, can you see that here too, or? No, it, yeah, it'll output, like, it, it, if you look at the switch before this level. Yeah. There's a couple different sort. Yeah, so you could just switch those that index. So, so that should. My, yeah. Ah, okay. This would be. This helps with the alignment. Yeah. I guess yes. There's like a white frame. I guess now that you're not pinning beforehand, it doesn't. Oh, this one right. But at least I can get the right direction again, maybe. Although then I messed it up um, yeah. with my uh, <laughs> which way am I? Also good because I see my pen twice as well. Everything is twice. <laughs> I think you have some flip issues here. Yeah, I do think that as well. Well, let me switch that over to a different uh, project where I got this. Uh, solve, I believe. Sure. Um, Greg, Greg was always also asking you to turn on the viewers so, so that you could see what was in there. Oh, okay, sure. Yes. We'll get to that. Um, start this one. Okay. Yeah. Flipping it around. Any other questions? While I'm loading. Nobody has any questions. That's no. that's that's unusual, isn't it, Harvey? Yeah. Marcus. Yeah, I'm never sure. That's a good thing. Maybe we have questions. <clears throat> All right, line those things up right here, and output separate window. Har Harvey Roy has a question for you. Oh. Yes, I built that one. Um, the quest, the quest. Yeah, if I built the corner pin component that we just saw on the screen. Um, yeah, it's just a couple uh, containers with corners. I can, I will, I will provide that if you want it. But it really just inputs the all the points to the corner pin top, which has always been sort of a pain to manually do. Yeah, um, you can have, I'll, I'll, po I'll post on the forum later. I'll post the whole thing on the forum actually, um, uh, if anyone's interested. And you can, also, you can also post in community, please. Okay, I'll do that instead. Thank you. Everybody <laughs> post assets and tutorials in community okay. and the forum. But. Okay, so, why are my actors not updating? Oh, there we go. Sometimes I have to look at them, but that's probably time for Yeah, me. that was another thing I had, but that's why I rendered it in the UI, is like I had to render 
all those SOPs or they wouldn't update okay. even if they weren't nice. if they were invisible. But. Hey, that looks great though. Look at that. But this is kind of the the idea, yeah, of that whole thing. Cool. Yeah. There's a couple of funny things. We just it's um, just to mention. Uh, I came across that recently, and I thought it's. It's not a nice, necessarily, what you maybe would call a nice solution, but it's something that works. Um, one thing is with OpenCV in touch, you can always um, use the cv2.imshow to actually display what OpenCV is doing, which is helpful. And um, the other thing that I came across was, um, this is like part of the work that I'm currently doing so this is, for example, a pattern generator. Now the problem is when you, I, you can make a chessboard pattern pretty easily in Touch Designer and you can make a, a symmetric grid or an asymmetric grid fairly easily. But when it comes to things like the Aruko um, pattern or Sharuko pattern, especially with being able to uh, like control the look of it, it's um, theoretically you might save out the image and then um, load it back in or something like this. But there's also, we updated, and maybe not a lot of people have seen this, we updated the uh, VFS file system uh, in touch. So that's the virtual file system where you can store files in a component. Mm -hmm. And then you can fetch from, uh, you can just fetch the file from the component. And uh, one of the additions to the uh, VFS file system is that you can um, save a byte array as a file. Oh. Onto a component and then read it. And that's exactly what, um, what I'm doing here. I'm not saving out the file ever to the hard drive, but um, Edit content in text port. Here we are. Um, where is it? It is actually, yeah. So you get your board, you create your Aruko or Sharuko board here, and then draw it into a variable, and then uh, encode it as a PNG file, convert this into a NumPy array, convert that to a string, convert that to a byte array, and then save that into a VFS. Um, yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. Are they stored in the backup files? They must be, yes. Like your file, if you're if you're saving those files, they must be stored in the backup files, and your files increase in size. Absolutely. So your toe, your toes get big. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's a it's a way you you actually you don't in like interacting with that is actually fairly quick. So you have an almost what seems um, it seems as if it's a built-in feature to mess around with these files. Uh, it's faster than like loading the frame. I mean, it's still encoded as a PNG. Yeah, right? it's still encoded as a PNG, but I, uh, I guess you don't have any any disk, uh, although that probably shouldn't matter too much either. Yeah. You're not writing to a disk, basically. I should put a cat on the paper. Um, my cats are lying around somewhere trying to escape the heat, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's how far I get basically with this, not sure. Cool, well this is amazing. I'm, I'm really impressed, I learned a lot. Um, it's really incredible. Yeah. Fun to work with OpenCV, I find. It's interesting uh, to try out a lot of things what they have. I yeah, mean, I was not able to get the rate like w every other frame like you have been able to. So uh, a couple of those tricks you were talking about with the deferred frame, 
Yeah, uh, that's, that's really cool. So yeah, I'm excited to jump back into it. Nice. Um, what else is there? Oh, right. You could also, I mean, you could do contour detection with uh, talk to stuff. You could skip the whole open CV. Oh, instead of CV, yeah. What is it called? Uh, I forget. I haven't used it in a long time. Is it called raster talk? Get the raster. It's not like a blob detect, right? Get the raster. No, the raster is. Uh, I used to use this in like Touch 17 a lot. Trace <laughs> trace, soft, trace. Right, says. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so the trace takes an image. You know, I forgot all about this thing. Um, this is what happens. You just forget after a couple of years that yeah. tops exist. And I mean, probably yeah. Like so two. that's a that's a good question. Why would I even go with OpenCV if we get? <laughs> good question. I don't know. Uh. <laughs> I guess you still have the issue where you you'd have to extrude this or something. You'd have to make this into a a tube. Yeah, the problem here is that you exactly you have to extrude it. You have constantly changing points. Um, you don't get each contour separately. Like it doesn't place them into. I'm not sure if you can place them into groups. Maybe that's possible actually. What happens if you put another object there? Uh, he wants you to show you the wireframe. Wireframe. There. Pretty. Yeah. And my computer is suffering. Five frames per second. Oh no. Right, just gonna shut that up again. Yeah. So with, theoretically, you could get there with the trace up, but there um, you would have to start then selecting out primitives um, to create. Um, to be able to uh, um, limit the number of points perhaps or have a constant number of points then extrude it, uh, things like that. So um, I think the fine contours is a totally fine way to do that. Uh -huh. Cool. All right. Um, let me bring you back in here. <coughs> there we are all again. Yay! One big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else feel like some borscht, or uh, I don't know, is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some red beets here somewhere lying around? Mm. Are those beets or no? Yeah, those are beets. Beets. I got all the beats. You have all the beats. I'm gonna add uh, Harvey's Four. social media links into the uh, into the chat. Yes, please. And uh, oops, there's two there. Let's try that again. Mm-hmm. So what next? Yeah, what's next? Where do we go well, from here? Yeah, where do <laughs> we go? I am out of things, but I I really appreciate the time. Thank yeah. you all for taking a look at that. Thank thanks you for... for uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing this on. It's a nice, it's a really interesting thing to do. And we should be, if maybe we can uh, figure that out, because you have worked on the uh, camera projector calibration you should totally be able to do this put this into uh, yeah projector. so that's kind of like the next step um i've been working on that camera and projector calibration kit yeah. but i wanted to get that a little farther along and then maybe integrate that back in and you, um, you but could, the uh, the camera is currently set to orthographic but um if you if you remove like the, if you have the projector um, position, then move the camera. You don't need that. Yeah, yeah. it could be perspective. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You just have to. Be that's a that's bit the real way to do it. No, no yes. stoner involved. Yeah. Yes, exactly. 
Apparently, apparently I can't post links to this chat, so Marcus, uh, as, as touch designer, or do you guys see my links, or? Uh, uh, they're on the stream. They're too. on the stream, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you could find me. I'm okay, right. for sure. <laughs> see a lot of familiar faces. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks so much. Another thanks, happy, appreciate that. An another happy Friday. Yes. For sure. Uh, have a nice weekend. And do you have to stay inside, Harvey? Or how does it work currently in... Um, in um, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think anyone's talking about a lockdown anymore, but I've been treating, you know, my life like a lockdown. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. just a lot of touch designer. That's for sure. A lot of staying inside. But uh, yeah, you need to recharge your uh, nature battery every now and then. Yes. So what do you do? What do you What are you doing for that? Uh, I mean, there's plenty of nice places to escape the city oh, yeah. in L.A. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you can just drive for a few hours and you're in the wilderness. So. Exactly. Very, in the desert wilderness. Yeah. Very lucky. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really thank appreciated you. that. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I hope nice. everyone has a really great weekend. Yeah, yeah exactly. and uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, again, uh, just a reminder for everybody out there to submit to join us on in session and submit your uh, submit your projects and questions. And uh, three weeks from now, from now, we could be here. Exactly. Yeah. See you in, <laughs> see you in three weeks, and talk to you soon, Harvey. Cool. Okay. Take Bye care, guys. everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.